So this is a microsurgical table for ear surgery. Uh, we have our standard uh, micro instruments here. We have our assortment of speculums, different size suctions. And we have some additional micro instruments, including micro scissors. These are our subperiosteal elevators, our freer, our big square, our Lempert elevator. Uh, and then we have an assortment of scissors here, as well as needle drivers, pickups and Adson and Adson Brown. Uh, and then we have our 15 blade for incision, double pronged skin hooks and sun rakes, and then our drills. Uh, standard for chronic ear, I typically use a five cutter, a three diamond and a two diamond for most ear cases if I'm drilling mastoid with or without canal plasty. And then we also have our assortment of alligators and cups, both our standard cups and then our micro cups. If you look at our different instruments, uh, these larger uh, suctions, uh, particularly the top two, we'll be using for when we're drilling. Uh, the larger uh, caliber is better for uh, suctioning up bone dust without getting clogged too frequently. Uh, then these intermediate sizes, the size 5 and 7, are good for when you're just starting to work down the ear canal or things like that and you're trying to remove a little bit larger blood clots. And we have our micro instruments, and all of these have a fenestration or a, a teardrop tip that you can um, release or add suction by taking your thumb on or off the hole. Uh, we have our three different sizes that we'll typically use for micro suctions, an 18, a 20, and a 22. The 18 is often good for just, you know, removing a lot of blood from the middle ear space, and the 20 and 22 are better when you're doing more fine work, such as after you've had a, a graft put in on a tympanoplasty, or if you're doing stapes work, we'll use a size 22 just to limit perilymph suctioning, etc. Uh, these are our different uh, speculums. In general, when you're doing uh, transcanal ear surgery, you want to use the largest size the ear canal will accommodate. And most typically, that's a size 6 or size 7. Uh, the larger speculum you use, the better uh, visualization and hand room and uh, light you'll get down uh, your microscope line of sight view. So we'll go through the standard micro instrument set. Uh, you know, different centers will use a different micro instrument setup, but I'll show you the common otologic micro instruments we use here. Uh, and I'll highlight the ones that are more, most commonly used by ear surgeons. So one of the most common uh, micro instruments used by surgeons is the sickle knife. The sickle knife is very nice because it has um, kind of three different parts to the, to the instrument that are helpful. On the front leading edge, uh, is it's sharp, and so you can use that to, to, uh, to cut along bone or soft tissue. And then the tip is more like a rosin. It's a fine tip right at the end. And then if you flip it around and you're dissecting, you can also use the back end of it, which is more blunt. So it allows you to kind of do different uh, different maneuvers with the same instrument. Uh, this is a lancet knife, uh, lancet knife, and this is uh, less commonly used by many people, but it is helpful in certain uh, situations. It's a lot like a round knife uh, uh, in the sense that the end is cutting, but uh, you might use it for a canal incision, particularly if the uh, if the tissue of the canal is really thick, like along the vascular strip. You could also use a round beaver blade. Uh, a bent beaver blade for the same purpose. Uh, here we have a large round knife, similar to the sickle knife, except it doesn't have the point. And there's also a small round knife. This is most commonly used when you're making your canal incision, your horizontal canal incision, and raising your tympanomedial flap towards your annulus. You're able to elevate and suction behind the leading edge of the round knife. This is a joint knife. In, in many ways, a joint knife uh, is like a round knife. It's just quite a bit smaller. Classically, this is used to divide the incutostipedial joint, but practically people use it for many different purposes. I'll tend to use it when I'm dissecting uh, clestiotoma off a of microstructure, foot plate, superstructure, etc. It kind of gives you that edge to pull things with, uh, and it's a, it's a very small instrument like a round knife. Uh, this is a rosin. Uh, there's many different ways a rosin can be bent and uh, the, the di diameter of a rosin, but it's basically a gently curved pick. And uh, this is probably the, one of the most common instruments that ear surgeons will use for microdissection in a lot of different situations. Here is a gimmick. The gimmick is also called the annulus elevator, and it's most commonly used after you've raised your tympanomedal flap to deliver your annulus from your annular sulcus. And you're able to slip it into the annul uh, by the annulus, and you're able to elevate up inferiorly quite efficiently when you're raising your tympanomedal flap. Uh, here's a straight point or a straight pick. It's very much like a rosin, except it, it's not curved at the end, and you might use it for similar applications. I'll use it at times for uh, making an incision on the round window for a cochlear implant. It has many different purposes, of course. This is a Schindler. It kind of a, has a duckbill shape. Uh, in many ways, it's like a very small freer, and you'll commonly use it for similar indications. You might be raising your uh, canal skin when you're doing a post-curricular 
uh, transcanal tympanoplasty, for example, many different uh, uses. And then we'll get into our um, right angles. There's a lot of different sizes you can have for right angles or right angle hooks. You can have a 3 millimeter, a 1.5, a 1 millimeter, 0 0.5, or 0 0.3 millimeter. And I'll show you one of the larger ones just to demonstrate the, the anatomy of the micro, uh, this micro instrument. And as you can see here, it's just what it says. It's a right angle. The tip tends to be sharp. You can work, use that to work around angles or to uh, extract something from the middle ear, move the prosthesis around, etc. This is our stapes measuring rod. It's commonly used for measuring uh, during stapedotomy. You'll, um, uh, you'll use this to measure uh, the distance from your long process of your incus down to your foot plate to determine what piston you're going to use. Um, uh, frankly, or to be honest, I actually almost always just use a 4.5 without measuring, but if you do want to measure, uh, this could be used, particularly if you're um, anticipating a malformed incus or something else like that. Here's a micro scissor. You can also use a Bellucci. Uh, this is a double action micro scissor. I find that this is uh, probably a little bit uh, more exact and more helpful than a Bellucci, but every once in a while you're not able to use this in a more tight space, and so we'll switch to a Bellucci, but this is a very helpful uh, middle ear instrument. This is a Durlachy. Uh, this tip uh, is a little more blunt, and it has a small right angle to it. It's, in my, in my opinion, extremely useful for moving around uh, gel foam that's becoming a little more spongy because of um, water content. And so like when you're Putting gel foam in the middle of your space on a, on a tympanoplasty, for example, it's super helpful. Uh, this is a Tomlinson. I call it the double-ended hockey stick. The nice thing, uh, there's several nice things about it, but uh, in some ways this is, in, uh, for me, has replaced the Whirlybird. Uh, it's a little bit uh, easier to use. The other nice thing about it is it's double-ended and uh, each end goes the opposite direction, so you just have to ask the surgical assistant uh, for the Tomlinson, and you know you'll have either the right or left going version of it. That's uh, very helpful. Uh, then we have our different assortment of different subperiosteal elevators um, or Lempert elevators uh, that, that can be used when you're raising your muscular periosteum or your ear canal skin when uh, you're going posterior to the transcanal. These are your different micro cups. Uh, so this is a little bit larger cup up here. And this is a more smaller, more delicate micro cup here. You'll be using those usually most commonly in the middle ear, but you also use it for tumor work. Alligators have similar function. I tend to use cups a lot more than alligators. I feel that they grasp things quite a bit better. And then you'll have, with your micro cups, you'll have a left going and right going micro cups, which is uh, very helpful for cholesterol work in particular. Um, we can look at our other instruments. These would be standard for what you might see in neck pans also, but our double pronged skin hook, that might be nice for when you're getting your temporalis fascia. Sen rakes we don't commonly use, uh, but you might end up using them. Uh, in some situations, our blade, and then our beaver blade. A beaver, that's a straight beaver blade. You can also get a, a beaver blade that's bent and looks almost like a round knife. And those are typically for canal incisions and things like that. And then we have our, our standard uh, different pickups that you might also see in a neck pan that probably don't deserve additional discussion. But that uh, kind of gives a, you know, a quick summary uh, uh, or overview of the micro instrument table setup that we'll use most commonly for uh, standard otologic surgery. All right, and here we have a standard otologic drill. Uh, these drills come in a diff many different varieties. Uh, some of the varieties you can have, uh, the older drills are pneumatic and they tended to have a much larger um, leash coming up to it and that would kind of get in the way. Uh, this is an electric drill. Typically when you're uh, drilling in ear surgery, you're going to be using around 60 to 80,000 RPMs on your drill. This drill has an on-drill irrigation. That's our preference here, uh, but many centers will use a suction irrigator, so the suction uh, will actually have an irrigation on the tip as well. That's just a preference be, uh, between different centers or different surgeons. These are your different drill bits, and the drill bits also come in many different assortments, but broadly there's two main types of drill bits. There's a cutting drill bit that tends to have multiple large flutes. This is a two-foot uh, uh, bit, um, but they also come with ones that have five or six flutes, and that's for uh, removing bone quite quickly. Uh, most of these you can ratchet at different lengths, so this is able to ratchet to one to five depth when you're putting in your nose cone of your drill. And then the second type of drill bit is a diamond. And there are two different, uh, at least two different types of diamonds. There's the coarse diamond and smooth diamond. Um, but you can tell these don't have flutes, uh, but rather they're more for polishing. Um, they're also helpful when you're drilling in uh, a lot of bone with marrow. They're helpful for controlling bleeding from the bone uh, itself. And uh, both of these Drills come in sizes from 0.5 up to 6 and even larger um, if you special order them, but we won't routinely use anything much larger than that or smaller than that either. 
Uh, but to load these, you'll change, you'll uh, turn your nose cone, you'll load it in place, and you'll lock it. And then I always test it to make sure it's good. When you're using your uh, suction irrigator, or sorry, when you're using your uh, on drill irrigation, I always make sure that the flow of the irrigation is coming down right over the top of my drill bit, so I'm effectively irrigating the field as I'm drilling, not heating up the bone. It's less, much less effective if it's shooting onto your drill bit and just splattering everywhere and not hitting your field. Uh, but that's your setup uh, for your standard drill. And putting a diamond on there is the same way. Again, we already, already talked about being able to ratchet it to different levels. You can feel it kind of clicking in and out as you go. So if I wanted a little bit longer length, I'll go up to five right there, lock it in place, and then ready to go. So one of the features that defines ear surgery is it's uh, most commonly done microscopically. We use a surgical microscope. Uh, more, uh, uh, more commonly today, people use endoscopes as well, but this is the standard uh, workhorse microscope that, we'd be, that we would use for ecology. This is a little bit more fancy one, uh, but this has magnet locks, so you can move it and then like release and it has a nice magnet lock, it will hold it in place and it's optimally balanced so you can just move it with one hand pretty easily. It's pretty important that you try to balance it um, or, or whoever's balancing it, balance it well and you want to test it before you start operating to make sure that you're having an optimal balance. It's really frustrating to have a microscope that's kind of tilting off to one side when you're working. Um, this is a dual handle grip uh, and on the microscope they'll have different handles and the configuration of the buttons are uh, personalized so your microscope might be different than this one but you'll have something that uh, allows you to add more light or subtract more light and there's also a continuous zoom function and then there's a focus function. The farther zoomed out you are for something the greater surgical depth of view you have. You don't have to f finally focus but if you zoom in really closely to something um, your focal distance is much more limited, just something we always uh, take into consideration when we're working. Um, we'll, t we'll commonly take the microscope and put it at the, at the head of the bed. We'll have the uh, operating uh, surgeon on the side of the head, of course, and then the observer is typically on the uh, superior aspect closer to the patient's head and less commonly down low because it's just hard for them to get into that position. But that, uh, that's a setup for the microscope. There's a lot of different types of microscopes. Again, um, you might use one without the magnet locks. Uh, uh, this is a nicer microscope that has 3D, which is we found is exceptional for our, our learners in the room as well as other people observing the case. So I think that wraps up the microscope.